So I'm at the airport and I'm about to get on a flight to Geneva and I'm super excited because I'm on my way to see the one and only MBNF and Max Busser. But I've just realised I've forgotten to pack any aftershave, so better go back and get some of that. Just a stone's throw from Lake Geneva, the Madhouse, as it's known, is the headquarters of MB and F, one of the world's most creative, some might say wacky, and definitely highly respected independent watchmakers. It was a real pinch me moment to be invited to spend the day at MB and F and to see behind the scenes of this amazing brand with unfettered access to the designers and micro-mechanical engineers and to see the painstaking work carried out by the watchmakers each of whom individually assembles one watch from start to finish. It was also incredible to have the opportunity to get hands-on with some of the watches and of course to spend some time with the founder, creative director and CEO, Max Busser, and to find out what makes him tick. So I'm delighted to be here at the Madhouse in Geneva with the one and only Max Busser. Max, thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege. Um, you know, my channel is still quite new, quite small, to have the opportunity to come in here and meet you and your team and see what you do here is a real honour for me and uh, thank you for being so generous with your time. Thank you Simon, it's a real pleasure. I'm only here like five days a month and it's true that they're five insanely intense days but I mean finding that hour is a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much and because you have been so generous with your time I wanted to bring you a gift. Okay. Now what do you bring Max Busa as a gift? <laughs> you know it's like the old joke what do you give the man who has everything? And I think the answer is a box to put it all in, isn't it? Um, but um, I wanted to bring you something. I brought you something from my own home that I've had for many years. It means a lot to me, okay. but I'd like you to have it. Wow. Um, okay. And the reason that I chose this was because um, my background is as a designer, uh, albeit a graphic designer. Um, and like you, I have a passion for design. So I wanted to give you something that, and I hope you don't already have one of these, but wow. I thought okay. I'm, this is something that, it. Wow. that you, I knew you would appreciate and might look great in the madhouse. Is it Philip, Philip Stark? Philip Stark. An icon. You know, I don't actually have one. Whether you And this is something, a piece when, um, sorry, I'll just put this here. When, um, when I was a kid growing up, because yeah, I'm old, but not that old. Um, I remember always thinking this was like one of the greatest design pieces ever. How could you make something which is utilitarian actually become a sculpture? Absolutely. And we're, I mean, 30 years, 40 years later, that's basically what I'm doing. That's super cool. Thank you so much, Dan Simon. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. So Max, for viewers of the channel who maybe aren't so familiar with you, um, I wanted to uh, ask you just to describe yourself. How would you describe Max Busser? <laughs> I'm clearly not the man I used to be 20 years ago or 40 years ago, so I'm 56 years old. Uh, I think we can say I was a very creative kid who around 18, 19 tried to meld in and, and became a very boring young man. And that lasted for a few years. And I think I got my mojo back around 35. So I was very lucky. So I did engineering. Uh, and after my, my thesis, I actually entered Jaeger Occult, which was the greatest chance of my life in 91 when the brand was virtually bankrupt and spent seven incredible years there. Then was incredibly lucky to become the head of Harry Winston timepieces uh, in 98 when I was 31. 
uh, did seven incredible years there also. And at some point, 2005, I launched MBNF, Maximilian Busa and Friends, which seems to me like it was yesterday. But when I look at what we've done in the last 18 years, it clearly was not done mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, and um, MBNF has been something which has been like a renaissance, as you say, like, a, a bit like, like being reborn. And um, our, our, our motto is a creative adult is a child who survived. I love that. And that's, I think that came from being super creative, then becoming a normal person and then going bonkers again. And that's, yeah, it's the, it's the rebirth. One thing I must say, so in preparing for this interview and, and to meeting today, I wanted to do my homework. So I watched lots and lots of interviews with you I'm over so sorry. many years, um, read as many articles as I could. And the really interesting thing for me that came out of this, um, and I wanted to just touch on a few things, is that you and I actually have a lot in common. Okay. So I believe we both have mothers who were born in India. Very much so, yes. We um, are both obviously creators. Um, my background was design, you are a designer. We both had probably quite difficult childhoods. I think mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about. Mm -hmm. um, we both used to be hi-fi salesmen. Incredible. Now, that's a fact that I never thought I would hear about you. Incredible. Right, exactly. When I was a student, uh, to make ends meet, I was a cinema usher, I would give maths tuition, and I would sell on, on Saturdays a uh, hi-fi at a little shop in Lausanne and I'd try and convince people to get a NAD instead of some other... Japanese yep. highfalutin things with lots of gadgets. I was like, no, you have to go and get a NAD because that's real quality. And spend lots of money on cables. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was the next step. Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, and the final one, of course, is, you know, we're both um, very charismatic, good looking, um, charming. <laughs> Actually, no, I think there's only one person in the room that can apply. Are you making to me blush. Okay. Thank <laughs> you very much. But no, I found it fascinating that, um, that some of these little details that came out. It's amazing. Um, so, um, I know you've probably talked about this before in other interviews, and I don't want uh, my audience to feel like they've heard this many times before, but um, just tell me a little bit about how you think your childhood informed your adult life in terms of where you are now. So um, I was an only child. I was a very lonely child. Um, I, for a very, very long time, sort of thought that my childhood was very unhappy. I sort of regretted it um, because when you're 13, 14, 15, you desperately need friends. You desperately need to be appreciated. And I, I was just weird. I was that dork. I was that guy who got a Commodore 64 and was coding on it when coders were not fashionable. <laughs> when I see the youngsters today, like, well, I'm coding. And everybody's like, oh, cool. Like, oh, God, nobody used to say that. And... Um, and so what's really interesting is that by being very much alone, I had this incredible space to imagine stuff, either drawing stories in my mind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's something which today's children lack a lot because they're all in front of screens. They're not all, but they tend to be in front of screens and just consuming instead of being alone and therefore imagining stuff. And so Today, I realized that was an incredible opportunity. And a difficulty can be an opportunity. When you are in the middle of the difficulty, you don't see it that way. And um, so many, many years later, when I started drawing my first MBLF pieces, and I put like the battle axe of Grandizer on it, I didn't dare tell anybody that the inspiration came from a Japanese manga from the 70s. It was unthinkable when you create a tourbillon, super complicated movement for 160,000 francs that I would actually mention that. And I think it took me like two years before a French and Chinese um, uh, journalist one day interviewed me and said, so where does the design come from? And I said, it comes from, in French it was called Goldorak. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's so cool. And I'm like, Really? You, you think that's cool? I said, yeah, yeah, I used to also look at Goldorak. And then I realized that 
being a, and I've always been as open as I can be and, and, and always telling the, the story as it is, actually resonates with not everyone, but those who do resonate, they get it. And of course, of course, it dates me because I mean, people who are 20 years old don't have no idea what Grandizer is and I cannot send them to go and see it because it's so lame today. When you look at it, it's like, okay, I was 13, I thought that was really cool. And I'm like, what? What was in my mind? But in those days, we had three television channels and I think we, we'd gone to color. <laughs> it wasn't any more black and white. So that was incredible for us. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I was probably at the time reading Commando comic. I don't know if you had that nope, in nope. Switzerland, but it was kind of a Second World War comic stories. Um, so if I'd have designed watches, it might have been very different. Probably military field watches would have, been, would have come out of it. So, Second World War was very much uh, in my childhood. I mean, I was born 22 years after it finished. And it was we, all the stories of the, uh, the Battle of Britain, the dogfights and the spitfires against the Messerschmitts. I used to make all the model airplanes. Mm. Who makes model airplanes today? And, uh, and so I would do all of that because I had time, because I was alone. Mm. And that's then you create the HM4 Thunderbolt 40 years later. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, absolutely amazing. And again, so many parallels because... I grew up um, with two older brothers, but quite a big age gap between okay. them. So six years and eight years older than me. Um, so I spent a lot of time on my own when I was a child um, because they wanted to be doing different things to me, you know, out on their bikes with their friends or later going to the pub or whatever it might be. And, um, and yeah, but again, the Second World War was also very um, big in my childhood too. And I'm a little bit younger than you, but I'll be 50 next year. Wow, okay. um, so it was less than 30 years it ended less than 30 years before I was born. Um, and that's become a real uh, fascination for me. It's one of my big interests. Um, Incredible. The other thing that um, I notice that we also have in common is a real passion for cars. Mm. So tell me a little bit about where this comes from. It's incredible because I only realized it this year. I mean, growing up is an ongoing psychotherapy. And um, because we released the HM8 Mark II, and I had already designed a lot of car-inspired watches. I wanted to be a car designer when I was a kid, but I just understood when I was talking to, to a journalist interviewing me, why I suddenly, why it was so important. And because my dad was of that generation who didn't really speak to me, I was <clears throat> sorry, brought up like kids are there to be seen and not heard. That's what I used to hear. Um, I realized that my dad, who had no means, he was middle class, um, had loved what, uh, loved cars. And I think from the very age of four, five, I realized that. And I started pointing out in the street, oh, uh, that's a Lancia, and that's a Fiat, and that's a Austin, and that's whatever. And I could see that he enjoyed that. And he started taking me to the car show, to the Geneva car show. And he never knew it because I stupidly didn't tell him, but it was the highlight of my year. I was going to do something with my dad. And so that sort of fostered this love of cars, which then I became obsessed with, and I was drawing cars all the time. Mm -hmm. So from the age of four to the age of 18, I was, uh, I was going to be a car designer for sure. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And very similar stories in terms, of, I remember my dad taking me to the London Motor Show. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so one of my big passions has always been the Ferrari brand, and I've never been had the means to afford one. I was lucky enough to borrow one when we got married. So my best friend at the time had a Ferrari California in white. Uh, and in fact, it was a funny story because he called me when he was visiting the showroom on the day he was placing the order and had to spec the car. And he said, uh, okay, what color should I get? He said, should I get a black or a white one? So I really want white, but what do you think? And I said to him, well, black would be my choice. But I'm getting married in a year's time. And if you get a white one, you can lend it to me as a wedding car. <laughs> so he did. Well, there, there were a few years back, you could get a 308 GT4 for the price of a Golf GTI. Yeah. Of course, then afterwards, the price you were going to pay over the years to come was going to be substantially higher than a Golf GTI just to make, yeah. uh, take care yeah. of it. But yeah. Well, the closest I came was a Maserati Grand Sport, which yeah. I had for uh, about a year. Um, it was six years old, I think, when I bought it. And it was incredible. I loved that car. Uh, within three months of buying it, realized I couldn't afford to run it. 
Ouch. Um, and so eventually it had to go. Um, but it's the only car that I've actually sold and made money on. So oh, that, was, you, that was a bonus. There you yeah, go. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to also talk a little bit about um, the beginnings of MBNF. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I find fascinating is um, so many people, successful people, um, you assume that they have always been successful at everything they've done. And of course, you had an incredible success at Harry Winston. There's no doubt about that. And uh, no doubt also at J.J. LeCoult before that. And am I saying that correctly, by the way? Because some people say J.J. LeCoult, some people say Jäger LeCoult. What's the correct, you tell me the correct That's been like this ongoing 30-year debate. Um, if Monsieur Jäger was from Paris, so he was French, and therefore you would say Jäger. But Jäger is actually Jäger. It's a German name. So um, it, he probably came from the north of France around Mulhouse, Strasbourg. I don't actually, I don't really know, but it was, it was typically a name from the German part. And so if you speak German or Saxon, Anglo-Saxon, you would say Jäger. And if you speak French, you would say Jäger. So you're okay. Whatever, you can't get okay. it wrong. Okay, that's good to know for yeah. future reference. Um, but one of, what I was going to say was that um, what I find really interesting is that I've heard you talk before about the early days of MBNF and how close he came to bankruptcy on more yeah. than one occasion. Um, so tell me what that period was like. And I imagine it must have been a real challenge to just keep the faith throughout everything and knowing that you had the ability to create something incredible and turn it around. Um, it's a great question. There are a lot of answers coming into my mind. I think I was totally clueless as to what being an entrepreneur is. Uh, I had no idea. There was no entrepreneur around me in my life. Um, I had a very romantic view of being an entrepreneur. And it's a good thing because whatever was thrown at me was part of the deal. I assumed that, yeah, that's normal. So it's going to be tough. It's normal. It's going to be very tough. It's normal. You probably will go bankrupt. It's okay. And I remember thinking when I created the company, I'll maybe go bankrupt, but I have to try. And so whatever speed bumps, and they were like some gigantic speed bumps we hit, it just seemed normal. And I think it's a Calvinistic upbringing. You're going to have to work like a dog and Maybe one day you'll be happy, but that's for sure not sure. And, and so it just, it was part of the deal. It, it, was, it was normal. So I didn't, people ask me, how did you keep the faith? For me, there was no, no question that the faith was going to go away. It's, I, what I didn't expect is what I've been living in the last three years. Okay. Meaning it's been incredible. I mean, this demand which goes crazy, um, this st- status which is put onto us. Um, I see the way people talk to me, which is so different to even just three years ago. I mean, people wouldn't talk to me <laughs> three years ago, and suddenly they come, oh, you're a legend. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you even talking about? My wife makes fun of me, like, legend, come to the kitchen and help me out. <laughs> like, is, that's not, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't expect it. Am I happy about it? Yeah, of course, I'm grateful. It's very embarrassing. But at the end of the day, the first 15 years is what I expected, which was the tough years. That was normal. Um, and it's interesting because I think it was one of my first bosses one day who told me that really stuck. You know, your first bosses end, end up good or bad being mentors. In my case, it was good. Um, he told me, if you don't come up with a solution, you're probably part of the problem. And of course, all of us have this tendency of going, oh, we have a problem. You go and see your boss, like, oh, we have a problem. And you're like, if you don't come with a solution, you're probably part of the problem. Okay. And that was drilled into me. So when you, you have your own company, there are no problems. It's just finding the next solution and just pushing and grinding and pushing and pushing. And, and we've come out with 20 calibers in 18 years in a company which is so small with such little revenue. That it's insane. Everybody in the industry comes up to me today, like, how have you done that? We pushed, we pushed, we pushed. 
Every cent we made, we put it back into the company. Mm. Um, every hurdle we hit, we tried to find ways to get over it, around it. There was, we didn't have any other option. And it's okay. And it's true that I see now younger generation uh, aspiring entrepreneurs who come to me and they've got still this romantic also vision of what I'm going to have doing my company. And I, I have to tell them, this is what I went through. Are you ready to go through that? Because if you're not, you're going for a rude awakening. If you've assimilated that it's going to be super tough and you may never be happy, go for it. But if you just expect, I'm going to create my company, create my stuff and be super happy, dude, you're in for a hard one. <laughs> that really resonates with me because um, my wife and I have our own brand. Mm -hmm. We have a fashion brand. Okay. Uh, I say fashion, it's um, a particular niche within fashion. So we actually design and manufacture wedding dresses. About 50 stores represent our brand now cool. in the UK. Um, but it has been such a difficult journey. And we're probably still in that phase of whilst the brand is established and people within the industry know the name, they like what we do, the brand is growing. But there have been some really tough times and lots of sleepless nights. And so to talk to you and hear your story and to see the success that you've achieved, yes, in a different world, a different industry completely, but to see that it wasn't a straightforward journey and there were lots of, as you call it, these bumps in the road, I think that really inspires me to keep the faith and, and have that confidence to just keep doing what we're doing. Have you read uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight? No. He's the creator of Nike. Well, nobody knows actually who Phil Knight is, but it's his story. It's an extraordinary book of, of 20 years of horrible difficulties, starting off trying to sell uh, his sports shoes in, in the back of his car on track uh, days in the 50s, selling one pair at a time, where he was not, it was not yet Nike, he was actually selling another brand, and how he, he tried to build a business out of it. And when, when the, the brand who he was actually selling, he realized was going to cut him off, he had only one choice was to create his own brand. That book is one of the greatest books ever of entrepreneurship. It's, um, it's interesting what you're saying because two years ago we sat down with part of the team to define what is the why of MBNF. I think every brand, every company should need a why. why. Why do we exist? Unfortunately, a lot of brands is we are there to give a lot of money to the shareholders. Well, okay, it can be, it's okay, <laughs> fine. But that was definitely not who we are. Why, why is MBNF around? And very quickly it took us, like, it was amazing, like 20 minutes to realize the number one why of MBNF is to inspire people to think differently, to be more creative, and to take more risks. If you can see what we've managed to do in such a short time, it still seems long, um, with such little means and keeping incredibly high ethics, yes, it wasn't, diff it wasn't easy, but we've managed. And maybe it will help you, whoever you are, to rethink your dreams now, I don't want everybody to suddenly become entrepreneurs and go bankrupt and go, because of the fucker in me. I don't want that to happen. But, but I would like to, to give a bit of hope that it is possible. Yeah. yeah. So look, we're here obviously to talk also about watches. Right? And you know, this is what people want to see. Uh, this is what you are famous for. So tell me about the sequential chronograph and how that came to be. Well, that's, that's, again, another incredible story. Um, Stephen McDonnell uh, develops the Perpetual, which comes out in 2015. He's invited to Dubai Watch Week to do a presentation in 2016, and I take him out to dinner after that. And during the dinner, I show him, I'm so proud, I show him a pocket watch, which is a split-second chronograph I've just bought from Tiffany. And um, it's my first split-second chronograph. And I'm showing him on my phone, and he is uh, pretty unimpressed. <laughs> and so I'm a little bit puzzled. And uh, he tells me, yeah, but split second chronographs. I mean, he says already chronographs. There's something which doesn't make sense. All chronographs, every chronograph in the market, over the hundreds of years we've been doing them, when you start them, they lose 20 to 30 degrees amplitude. 
and that means their performance goes down, their precision goes down. So just at the moment you need it to be more precise because you're timing something, it's actually less precise. And split-second chronographs are way worse because of all these clutches. And on top of that, they usually, except for Lange, they don't have a second minute counter. So when you're timing <clears throat> two different things which are three minutes apart over 15 minutes, that you know the first time, but you don't know the second time because all you have is a second. You don't know if it's three minutes less, five minutes less, more. You have no idea. So I'm listening to him, and it's a little sort of a, these aha moments where you realize that you think you know stuff and you have no idea, <laughs> and you feel very humbled. And I'm like, okay, so what? Can we do something about this? And he looks at me and says, I have an idea, but I'm not exactly sure. Give me some time. So this is November 2016. January 2018, that's over a year later, he comes to see us with already original plans with a system where he can actually create a chronograph which doesn't lose any amplitude when you start it. It's mind-boggling. And from there, he builds a movement where he actually adds not one function, two functions, four functions. Two independent chronographs, which you can actually time two different times whenever you want. The split second version where you've got the two chronographs start at the same time and you can stop and start them whenever you want with two minute counters. The sequential, which allows you to lap time de facto. You've got a car racing, goes around the lap. When it finishes its first lap, you need to know the time of the first lap and you need to start the timing of the second lap simultaneously. That Movement to continue does that. timing it, yeah. Exactly. Continues going on, but it gives you the intermediate time each time. And it, on top of that, as the bonus, it's a chess aggregator if you do chess championships. Um, at the end of the day, it's not only incredibly innovative, it's beautiful. He's designed an incredibly beautiful movement. It's 585 components. What you have to understand at MBNF, we hand finish all our components. We're a handful of creators which still do that. It's very important for me. Most people don't realize it. We don't even speak much about it, but it's, it's who we are. We want to be proud. That's what we're going to do. And we craft, I'm going to say about 30 to 35 sequentials a year. Uh, it's about two to three a month. It's an uphill battle, but it's, um, it's so worthwhile. That's incredible. I mean, because it's such a complex piece and you know, as you say, 585 components yeah. in it, the assembly, the production. That's a, a real achievement for the size of company you are. That's what we do. That's, it's, we're at a point where if we don't push ourselves, if we don't take risks, if we don't do something we've never dared do before, we feel, we feel dead. I feel like saying we... We need that adrenaline. We're adrenaline junkies. We're, we're engineering adrenaline junkies, creative adrenaline junkies. If we don't take risks, if we don't create something which has never been done, we don't feel alive. Now, one of the things that uh, I find really fascinating um, and just so inspiring is the fact that whilst most of your clients, I imagine, are, let's face it, probably super wealthy, yeah. Um, to be able to afford your pieces, um, either that or you know they've sold their house and all live in a caravan. Um, we have a few clients who have gone that incredibly extra mile to get maybe it'll be a legacy one hundred and one uh, or a on the secondary market a pre owned piece which you can get cheaper. We have those, and, and those are even more rewarding as a creator. I must admit, I can imagine. But what I, what I love is the um, concept of the Mad Editions. Mm -hmm. So just explain a little bit about how that came into being. Um, and of course, you've just recently launched another edition. Right. I'd love to talk about that and, and hear your take on that. So I come from a middle class family and I am incredibly blessed that I've created this company which works where I'm able to create what I believe in, where we craft these incredibly complex and beautifully hand-finished pieces, but they come with a price. And nobody in my environment can actually afford them. So, yes, I'm blessed and happy, but when the people you love cannot 
buy a Ford, where the pieces you create, there's a moment where you go, what's the point of all of this? And so there's always been in the back of my mind, I wanted to create something that they could afford. So actually, when I, most people don't know, is when I created MBNF, I'd actually created a second brand alongside, which was in the 3,000 francs, which was like a modified Valjoux movement with a transparent case. Is this what I've heard you refer to as Green Dog? Green Dog, Green Dog. exactly. It was called Green Dog, which it was, and there was a whole concept behind it. And, um, and I needed, um, I think I needed about a half a million Swiss francs to, to launch that. And all my savings had been put in MBNF, so I didn't have a cent left. And I never found the money. And I'm lucky because it was so tough at MBNF for the five to seven years which followed that I have no idea how would I have managed two brands in parallel. I'd probably completely gone bankrupt. And uh, in 2014, I designed, I imagined the Mad One, what was going to be called it was actually not going to be called Mad One. It was a, a whole new brand again. I was, oh, I'm going to create a brand around this. So as far back as 2014? 2014, wow. Yeah. And from 2014 to 2018, we worked on the brand, we'd engineered the pieces, and um, in 2018, I killed the project. Because I realized, yes, I love to put myself in danger, but here it's becoming a little bit stupid because I don't have enough time for my family. I don't have enough time for MBNF. How am I going to manage another brand alongside that? So as a creator, you get your adrenaline from creating. Then all the rest is necessary evil. <laughs> it's, it's the production, the, uh, the selling, the marketing, all that stuff is like, oh, God, I have to do that. But Typical designer. You, know. <laughs> you, just, you just want to create stuff. And, um, and so I killed it. And then during COVID and during the lockdown, we were in Zooms with the team. And I was like, OK, guys, we're probably gonna not survive this one. Um, what do we have which we could actually make a bit of money without doing any R&D? And somebody said like, well, there's that watch at three grand. Wait a minute, I'm not gonna launch a new brand now. I'm already don't, don't know how to keep my existing brand to survive. And in that brainstorming, we, we basically came up with the idea of the Mad Edition, which was not a brand, and that's the beauty. We can stop it anytime we want. It's an edition, like a gallery decides to do an edition with an artist. And we decided to go ahead and do 400 and 450 of, the first of those pieces. But as the months went through, we realized we were not in jeopardy, but actually the demand on the brand MBNF went crazy. And we said, well, okay, we'll still keep that project. And we'll keep that project to say thank you. And that's how Mad, what Mad Edition 1 started. And then of course, on social media, everybody went bananas and I get it. A lot of people, fans of MBNF said, we love what you do. We'll never be able to afford it. And now you create something I can actually afford and you're only selling it to MBNF owners. Like, what does that mean? I'm like, okay, you're right. So it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It's a project which is it's a, it's taken a life of its own. I, it's, it's not something, it's, it's something which cannot put MBNF in jeopardy but it's already much bigger than I've expected and I have to deal with this. And, um, and what's done also, what's really done, which is great for me, is that I've got so many projects in the pipeline on MBNF that if I come with a new idea today, my engineers will look at me and say, 2031, 2032, at the best. I, I don't, I just don't wanna wait eight, nine, 10 years. Uh, so it's given me a whole new segment where I can actually enjoy creating. And there's, a, there's MAD 2 and MAD 3 and MAD 4, and they're all in the pipeline. And they're not all my ideas because it's an addition. Okay. So there will be ideas from other people around me, which uh, I admire and I enjoy working with. And it's, okay, you've got an idea. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll showcase your idea. Uh, and it's, it's, also, it's also a way of giving back for me. And I love that. I love the, that almost democratization of MBNF to a degree, because it does mean that people with maybe the budgets, the, my collecting budgets, you know, could still own a piece of MBNF. But then it brings another issue, and we just gave the results of the lottery, the raffle yesterday, and there were 30,000 people who signed up for the raffle, and we had 1,500 watches, and that means 28,500 unhappy people. Yeah, and I'm one of them. <laughs> and I'm sorry. And, 
And so I've just been submerged over the, since yesterday afternoon with messages of people going, I'll never be able to get one. It's the third time I'm participating and I didn't win. And, and look at these guys who are buying them and flipping them. And I get it. But I haven't found a better way than doing a raffle because there's no way I can deal with 30,000 people on a waiting list when we craft 1,500 pieces. Absolutely. Say, okay, well, you're going to be in 12 years. And, and I, that's not the point. I, I want to do 1,500 and go on to something else. Yeah. I don't want to do 30,000 pieces. So again, it's a work in progress. We're learning. And actually, that's probably one of the most important things you realize growing older is learning. Doing is great. Learning is even better. So we're, we're, we're learning by doing. Yeah. And that's, that's very important for us. Yeah. I was really pleased to hear that you'd actually um, had a kind of an adjudicator for the raffle to, to make sure it was completely fair until I didn't win. And then I was wishing <laughs> that it hadn't been completely fair and you could have rigged it in my favor. So it's, it's, it's really important. We're very Swiss on that. Um, and, and also because, um, yeah, there are a lot of disgruntled people who couldn't get them. And, uh, and I'm sorry. I really am. I'm, I'm fundamentally sorry. But I am not going to produce 10, 20, 30,000 mad editions a year. That is not what we're about. So Max, I just have a couple of questions I'd like to ask you from um, people who are in the audience of my channel. Okay. Um, so let me just put these on and I can see something and I can read them to you. So the first, which comes from uh, Watches with Abdullah. And he says, from your experience, is partnering up with another watch brand to collaborate on new ideas beneficial for the watch industry in the long run, specifically as a creative strategy and not purely for marketing? Ah, so I tend to, um, I'm going to make a lot of friends here. Um, I tend to dissociate that collabs have become super trendy. So I, I think I was one of the first in the watch industry 20 years more than 20 years ago with Opus One and Harry Winston. Um, I believe a collab has one goal, to create a great product, a fantastic product that neither would have created by their own. Now, today, a lot of collabs, not only in the watch industry, is marketing and branding, and I slap this logo or that color on this product, and we make a bit of buzz. Um, it's two different animals. There is one where these, these two individuals, two brands come together to create something they would never have created. What we just did on, on Only Watch with the uh, pandemonium with my H, our friends from H. Moser, they would never have created that product. I would never have created that product. And we've, we've done it. So that, that's great. Okay, the next one comes from Aid M. Smith. So ask Max which watch he would bequeath and what he'd say about it to the person that he passes it to. Wow, is it one of mine or in general? You can pick. So I find watches are um, sentimental vectors. They're, they, they, they're a vector to transfer something. So it could be either because it's a watch created by somebody I know who's put all his or her soul into it and have gone through incredible lengths to create it. So those all are my independent friends. And, uh, and when I wear my Orverk, I, I, I never forget that Felix uh, started his company while living in an abandoned building and going to public toilets to shower while he was the owner of MBNA, of, of, of Orverk. Um, so, uh, you, you know what they've gone through to create. That, that means something. Or it could be a product which you bought at a specific time of your life. And it was, a, you usually buy a piece to reward yourself or to celebrate something. And, and therefore, if you give it to somebody else, it's a part of that celebration which you're giving to. So it's, it's, there's two ways, but it has to be an emotional vector. Okay, so last question comes from Yad Hakim. He's got lots of questions, actually. So I think one you've already answered. Any possibility for another Mad One version? You said there are several in, yep. in the pipeline for the future. Yep. Um, but he said not just for another color, but what about other complications such as the GMT? So um, we have got a price constraint. And um, as much as I would love to put complications, I want to create something which 
as a, was it Mary Kondo, which brings joy. And, uh, and so that's the point. I, I want to create something when you look at it, you're like, ah, oh, this is cool. And I also want to bring something which looks much more expensive than what it is. I think that's the mad one that plays the game there. And, um, and so adding function is not something I'm looking at. There are many other ideas I'm working on. Okay. Max, we'll wrap it up there. I want to say thank you for how generous you've been with your time, uh, for inviting me here today. I can't wait to see some of the watches and get hands on with them. Um, but Max Busser, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.